Welcome. I'm Chad Pritchett from the City Manager's Office. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of our citizens tuning in today to our first show uh, covering the operating budget for fiscal year 2013. This is the first in a series of shows that we anticipate producing to keep our citizens abreast of the progress that we're making in developing a balanced budget for next fiscal year. Our goal today is really to cover broad topics, including the major components of the operating budget, both the revenue side and the expenditure side, and really address some of the challenges that we faced in the past, some of the trends that we've seen that have impacted our decisions in the past and, and probably will continue to impact our decisions into the future and really just cover a lot of ground and provide our citizens a basic understanding of, of how we go about establishing an operating budget in the city every fiscal year. So with that, we plan on covering a lot of ground. And I'd like to introduce you to uh, two guests that we have here in the studio today, City Manager Neil Morgan, thank you for being with us, and the Director of Budget and Evaluation, Lisa Cipriano. Uh, Lisa, this is not your first budget. No, Chad, it's, I think, if I can count on all my fingers and toes, about my 27th. So you bring some good veteran experience to the process. Yes. So before we dig into the details of, of the budget and get into the specifics, I want to offer you both the opportunity to just, without being constrained by any particular question, um, offer up some initial thoughts on your perspectives on the upcoming budget and maybe some challenges or, or your expectations for the process. Well, as, as everyone knows, the, really the um, economy since uh, fiscal year 2008, 2009 has, has not been good. And while things have been better in Newport News and Hampton Roads and many places, uh, every budget that I've been involved in since I've become city manager has been one characterized by shrinking revenues and expenditure cuts. And we can see in the stage of preparation we're in this year that it's going to be no different this year. And so what we thought we would do today is really try to give citizens a, a window inside uh, what we're seeing in this early phase of the budgeting process. Stated another way, if you want to be entertained for the next 30 minutes, you can go ahead and change the channel. But if you really want to understand uh, the broad trends on both the revenue and expenditure side and the kind of choices we're facing as a city, I hope you'll uh, stay tuned and, and pay attention to what we had like to share with you today. So Lisa, let's kick it to you for your thoughts on the process this year. Well, to um, echo what Neil has said, it has been a difficult several years balancing the budget with declining revenues. Um, we do see some changes in the revenues based on our current year experience that we hope to continue into the next fiscal year, but that doesn't mean the decisions that we will be making in the next few months still won't be hard. They will be hard for us as an organization and as we move forward as the economy continues to remain slow and sluggish. So now we're going to talk about the operating budget today, and I think by default we're talking about the general fund operating budget, but that's really only one piece of the city's broader financial plan. Can you help us frame up maybe what that broader perspective looks like, just briefly? Sure. The general fund is the fund that most citizens receive their mo more familiar services, like fire and police protection, um, all of our correction facilities, our parks, our libraries, our health and welfare departments. Those are the really large services that come from the general fund. There are other funds that support specific needs, but for, today, for today's discussion, we will be generally talking about the general fund. Okay, so let's, let's start with revenue, because I think that's a good starting point. When you develop any budget, you probably want to think about your available resources and work from there, and I know that's how we, that's how we handle our process as well. And actually, before we dig, dig into revenue a little bit, can you help us understand the city's current budget process? I know departments are underway now with their budget packages for fiscal year 2013. What does that process look like? Basically, Chad, the budget process lasts an entire year. We begin in July and August, framing up what we have seen as the most recent occurrences in the recently closed fiscal year. By September, we give information to Neil on where we anticipate our revenues to be, any known changes or trends. By October, the city manager submits out to the department's instructions and in philosophy on what to anticipate for the upcoming fiscal year. By January, the departments submit their requests. During February and March, the budget department and the city manager uh, finalize all the numbers. And by the second meeting in March, Neil will give the FY13 budget to the city council as his recommendation. City Council then in the months of um, April and May will have public hearings, hold many work sessions and discussions, and hopefully adopt the budget in the May timeframe. 
Okay, great. Let's let's go back to the uh, discussion of revenue then. Neil, what are the major components that make up general fund revenue, and what are some of the trends that we've seen in the recent past? The most important thing for people to understand, if you're putting a budget together in Virginia, is the single largest source of revenue for a locality is property tax. The second largest source of revenue is, is funding from state government. And for the, what will apparently be the fourth year in a row, at least, uh, both of those two largest sources of revenue appear to be trending downward yet again. And so when you simply add up the arithmetic of all the different sources of revenue, and there are many other smaller revenues, and some of those have been performing better because our local economy is better than average, still in all, uh, we all know that uh, real estate values have been coming down. So we're looking at a significant cut uh, in that regard. General Assembly is uh, getting ready to meet. Um, and probably as many of you are watching this show, they're beginning their uh, deliberations for the next biennium. While we don't know for sure what's going to come out of that, oh, <laughs> there's no question that uh, money's not going to be going north, it's going to go, be going south again. So as we frame our overall expenditure plan uh, and figure out uh, what cuts we might have to make for next year, uh, unfortunately we start with the uh, very uncomfortable uh, assumption that our two biggest sources of revenue are going down again. One other point before I'll kick it over to Lisa to talk about maybe some of those other uh, brighter spots in our revenue picture is people might say, well, you know, apparently there is somewhat of an economic recovery, uh, things are looking somewhat better. Why are you projecting yet another year of decreased revenue? And, and the fundamental answer is there's a lag time in the way property taxes are assessed. So really, uh, the way that's picked up in the city budget process um, is really almost a year behind what's going on in the economy. So at the beginning of the recession, uh, there was a little lag before that hit us, and now that things are starting to uh, appear to be improving nationwide, unfortunately there's a lag on the other end that's detrimental if you're uh, trying to put a city budget together. Is there any sense as to when we might bottom out and see a recovery in assessment values? Uh, you know, different people are uh, you know, forecasting uh, different outcomes. I think there's some evidence that there might be the beginning of some stabilization on real estate. Now, of course, the other thing is when new things are built, uh, that adds to your, to your tax base. Mm -hmm. And so um, as things like the apprentice school come online and the new Walmart and some of the other developments in the city, that will, to some degree, counterbalance the, the general downward trend in assessments. Uh, but I've got to tell you candidly that for the year beginning next July, it's probably going to be the single largest drop in real estate uh, revenue that we've had to project uh, during four years of, um, of downward trends. That, that's correct, Neil. Um, just to put things in perspective, right now our general operating budget is $415 million. At the beginning of the recession in fiscal year 2009, it was 433 million. So that's quite a drop in just a very short period of time. Of the current 415 million dollars, over half of it comes from general property taxes. But that also includes personal property taxes, real estate taxes, and machinery and tools taxes. Now we have seen some growth in both machinery and tools and personal property taxes in the current fiscal year that we hope will continue on as the months move forward. Other local taxes that are very consumer sensitive like meals tax and sales tax and lodging tax have done surprisingly well during this recession. We actually anticipated them to be worse and the receipts on a monthly basis are fairly stable. So we're hoping to see some sort of um, straight line, if not some growth in those few areas in our revenue streams. So let me just summarize on what it looks like from, from my perspective and Lisa's heading into the budget season. Our two biggest revenue sources will be going down, real estate and general assistance from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Many of our other smaller revenue sources will be stable or perhaps if we're slightly optimistic, will be trending up slightly. Unfortunately, you, you add all those smaller ones up and take it all together, it's, it's a smaller percentage than just real estate. Now, when, when you think about the real estate tax portion of it, there are a couple components there. There's obviously the assessments. It's straight multiplication 
there's the assessments and then also the rate. The rates come down pretty dramatically from a few years ago. It was as high as $1.27. So we're now at $1.10. Uh, why not just raise the rate to recapture some of that revenue and, and make the math not as dramatically negative? Well, uh, there are some localities in Hampton Roads uh, that have done that in the past year, and I would imagine there'll be some more this year. Uh, I have indicated to the budget office and the departments that we're going to try uh, yet again this year not to raise the rate. There's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that uh, the citizens of Newport News are still dealing with the difficult economy uh, themselves, and if we can put together a responsible budget and avoid a rate increase is certainly what we want to do. Uh, now, having said that, if the trends we're talking about uh, continue uh, in the out years, I mean, there will come a day in the fairly near future where uh, a city manager cannot recommend a responsible budget uh, to provide the services the citizens expect without a real estate tax increase. But to be clear, uh, my premise going into this year is we're going to try to put this budget together uh, without that for this year. As a citizen, it's probably worth pointing out that in these years of, uh, of a stable rate, um, with assessments going down on average, for the average property owner, what that really means is effectively we've been cutting property tax now uh, for certainly this would be the, the third year in a row if you know, we can hold the rate stable again this year. Another way to frame that, um, Chad, is we develop our revenue projections first. We're fairly certain within some degree of um, change where our revenue collections will be at the end of the fiscal year. And what we do is we shrink our expenditures to fit within our revenue projection. We don't add to our revenue. We don't try and build it up by changing the tax rate, but rather on the other side, cut, cut, cut to fit within that revenue picture. Let's flip the switch here if we can and talk about expenses for a second. It seems like our starting point for the fiscal year 13 operating budget will be something like $415 million, which is consistent with the FY12 current year operating budget. So I think, Lisa, I want to kick it to you in a second to talk about the major components that make up the expense side of the equation. But it's also my sense that we've got some expenses that are beyond our control that we have to deal with every year, including utilities, fuel, and also pension. You know, can you discuss those briefly for us? Yeah, you're, you're right about that, Chad. If somebody's listening and you say, well, we might have about as much money this year uh, as we're going to have next year, your, your reaction might be, well, that doesn't sound so bad. And certainly compared to some localities in America, that would be a true statement. But just like your family budget, we have uh, some, some fixed costs that uh, we have to deal with. One of the big ones is uh, our pension system. As you know, we've uh, reformed our pension system. Uh, current employees have been asked to, to accept uh, reduced benefits, and we've uh, revamped the system uh, for new employees. But still in all, we have to pr provide for the commitments that the city made over the last 30 or 40 years to employees who have retired or will retire. And that has required us to significantly increase pension contributions. For the budget year that we're now working, I believe the, uh, the overall pension increase from the general fund would be something on the order of three million, and if you counted all funds, something on the order of five million. And, and if you look over the last four or five years, it looks like we've doubled the contribution from the yep. general fund to the pension fund, which is a big number. Right, and you take that right off the top, and that obviously makes other things harder mm -hmm. when you have a, a, a steady or shrinking revenue base. Um, but that's not the only cost. Uh, fuel and energy costs, for the most part, have been trending upward. Don't need to tell anybody that healthcare costs have continued to trend upward, and of course, providing uh, significant uh, health care insurance for our, our, our workforce is important because we have to recruit, recruit and retain quality people, which is an important part of what we do. Um, so even while um, um, dealing with um, a stagnant revenue situation or declining revenue situation, we've got to start out each year factoring in all the things that we know are going to go up no matter what which then makes the challenge of, okay, what in there can be cut that much, that much harder because there's a significant piece of that budget that really isn't discretionary in the, in the near term that we really can't touch. And I was hoping uh, this might be a good point in the conversation to share with folks some of the things we have done during this recession 
uh, to demonstrate uh, fiscal responsibility and uh, limit expenditures wherever we can, if that's okay. Yeah, if we, before we do that, let's talk about just generally where the money goes on the expense side. Okay, in the general fund, um, very broad categories. We have our contribution to schools, which is 112 million. Mm -hmm. So we're talking over 27 percent of that 415 million dollar budget. We have about $35 million that go to our debt service, which comparing it to a household income, that's your mortgage or your rent payment or whatever other debt you may have out there. You basically have to pay that off the top. Mm -hmm. That leaves about 43% for salary and French benefits because you have to have people to provide the services to the citizens. And that leaves a very, very small portion of money left for the things that Neil was talking about earlier, for fuel, utilities, and the basic tools that create the services within the city. If we look at it differently, can, can you break down, throw a question out there, what percentage of the general fund expenses are comprised by people or positions? That's about 43%, which is about $178 million. Now, as Neil indicated earlier, we have staff that provide those services. One of the tools that we've used to balance the budget is to cut positions. Um, and we've done that really in two different ways. Um, if you want to talk about that, Neil, at this particular point. Yeah, I guess the um, important thing to understand is um, the city government is labor intensive. If you think about what we do, basically there's almost no service that can be delivered that doesn't involve a lot of people, right. whether it's uh, paramedics, police officers, sheriff's deputies, people that pick up your trash, people that fix your roads. We're producing services, yeah. Uh, and it's people. Yeah. So most of our money goes for people, and so obviously it's kind of a no-brainer if you have to cut uh, limiting your expenditures on people is, is the way to go. Now we've done that several ways. One is uh, we've eliminated about 5% of our workforce over the last three years. We just simply eliminated the positions. Fortunately, the vast majority of those have been done through attrition. While we've had some very small reductions in force, we haven't had any widespread layoffs, and that's you know, a good thing from, from many different perspectives. We've also um, harvested what uh, some would call personnel laps. And that's been uh, one of the significant sources of savings that working with the budget office we've been able to come up with. And what that does is basically you count the number of people in a department, you figure out how much money uh, it costs to pay them, and you have a number in your budget. It used to be that we fully budgeted for all those positions at some average salary. But in recent years, what we've basically done is we've gone back in and calculated uh, how many people are going to be uh, out of that particular uh, workforce in any average year, and we've cut the budget by that amount. So, for example, if you're a big department like the police department or the fire department, we said, okay, on average you're carrying a certain number of vacancies. Take that much average money and take it out of the budget. That was a, an excellent strategy, but what I want to communicate to the citizens is we're done with that. We've taken all of that out of the budget. Last year, we even went back to a bunch of little departments that only had a handful of people. Previously, we had said, well, you can't really assume somebody's not going to be there in a four- or five-person department. And so what we did was we compiled all the smaller departments and then came up with an average and took some more money out of the budget for that. So we're kind of over that. that. We can't revisit that strategy this year. Really, there was a, there's a third way that we've tried to control expenditures on the personnel side and that is uh, with salaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the last three years, uh, we have only had one 2% salary increase. And, um, you know, I, certainly I think the city workforce is appreciative of their salaries and benefits. They know that many other people have it, you know, tougher than they do. But still in all, you're trying to motivate a workforce, a workforce that's 5% smaller, uh, and you're not putting a lot of money into salary increases and then over time that's another issue you have to be concerned with. So if the question is how have we cut the budget in the last few years, we've taken a big bite out of personnel cost using those strategies. But that's not the only way 
uh, we've taken on expenditures. And Lisa, I don't know, you might want to um, identify a couple of the other things. I'm, I'm proud mm -hmm. of some of the efficiencies we've undertaken. Yes. Um, and, and that's probably worth mentioning. Um, we've tried very hard to, one, limit the impact that the average citizen has felt by these cuts, um, as, well, as well as the workforce. Um, as Neil indicated, by cutting the personnel costs that we have, we've avoided furloughs, which is very important for keeping the local economy up and working. Um, we've done things like limited our um, paving, our uh, streets paving and reconstruction. We've stretched out that time that we will resurface a certain area. We have stretched out our equipment life, our information technology equipment, and more importantly, our rolling stock. Our vehicles. Yeah. Yes, our vehicles. We've added um, years and miles and running time to our vehicles. While optimally that's not what you would want to do, we've done it within the money that we have and still be able to provide the services that we do have. We've also have made some um, changes in things like our bulk waste collection. So we now mimic more how a residential household uses bulk waste, which is every other week, instead of sending our trucks around the city on all the routes once a week. That's another example of how we've extended the life of our equipment, extended our staff involved with that, all within a lower amount of an operating budget. And, and I guess one of the things that, uh, one of the leave behinds from this show that we would like folks to understand is, um, we have been scouring the budget and identifying some of these types of savings. Now this will be the fourth year and it gets harder each time. And so uh, when the budget is presented and there's some reductions in services uh, in there, which is going to be almost inevitable, uh, I hope folks will uh, be patient and take into account that um, there aren't a lot of easy choices left. There are very few things uh, that we cannot spend money on uh, that won't have some impact on services. And even some of those things that Lisa and I mentioned, like freezing positions or reducing the staffing for certain things or stretching out the replacement cycle for vehicles, some of those things uh, it would be unwise to continue those strategies indefinitely. At some point you get into a real hole on something like street repair or the replacement of vehicles where uh, it would be more expensive not to replace them. Sure. And that's something we've got to guard against. And when we talk about positions in the 5% reduction, uh, I think it's important to, to make mention that we've held public safety pretty harmless. We've, we've kept those positions on the books and available for hire, and they have not been as dramatically reduced or subject to elimination. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing that out because uh, if you look at our budget, uh, Lisa broke it down before, uh, the, by far the largest category of expenditures other than education is public safety. Police, fire, paramedics, sheriff's deputies, that type of thing. And um, the cuts in that area of endeavor have been much smaller than the rest of the budget, and, and rightly so, because I think most folks would say that um, that is a core responsibility of city government. And as we evaluate the budget and the recommendations we bring forward to council each year, uh, that's always been a high priority to, to protect. Gets tougher though, got to say. Well, to help in the um, decision-making process this year, the Efficiency Committee, which is made up of citizens and local professionals, have um, are reporting to City Council in the near future about using a balanced scorecard approach on decision-making for the city. And not to get too complicated, but basically what a balanced scorecard is, the four stages or four legs of a stool are customer service, organizational development, meaning how well do you take care of your people and educate them and provide the tools that they need to do their job, best business practices, are you measuring against yourself and as well as other entities that might be similar that you want to attain a goal towards, mm -hmm. and are you using the best financial practices possible? So those are the four legs that we always want in balance. 
goes to say if you have one of those on, in balance, then you're tipping over, you're not allocating your resources in the best way possible, and your goal is always to keep all four of those firmly on the ground. We've aligned it with our strategic eight goals. What we've asked the departments to go back and do is take these four areas, line it up with our strategic goals, and divide their current operating budget up by functional activity. By identifying how critical these four areas are to our strategic eight and tying it to dollars, we hope to be able to identify programs or areas that maybe have a lower importance that might be easier to target for consideration in the near future. And, and if I could just uh, play off of that, Lisa, the thing that's exciting about the balanced scorecard, first of all, it came out of a, a collaborative effort that involved citizens uh, and staff. Some of the citizens have been people who have been critical of the city's expenditures in the past. And it was something that the staff could get excited about and it's a new analytical tool as we go forward in the budget process. We're experimenting with it this year and we hope to make it a much more disciplined and rigorous part of our budget process next year. One of the neat things about it is it's very intuitive and it helps remind all of us, including uh, interested citizens, uh, to guard against the simple short-term arithmetic solution to a budget problem at the expense of the long-term effectiveness of the organization. For example, some people will say, well, why don't you cut out all travel and training? You know, they don't really need that. Then you go, well, wait a minute. You know, if you're going to have an effective city organization, don't you want your law enforcement people to have the, the latest training and the latest credentials? Don't you want your paramedics to be up to snuff? Don't you want your public works operation uh, to meet uh, national standards? Don't you want your water treatment to be at the highest level? Don't you want the guy that inspects your elevator to be trained? Of course you do. And so it helps us to think about budgeting from a longer term perspective. It's not only you got to make the arithmetic add up this year, which you do, but you got to be thinking about are you going to have the people with the skills and the motivation to provide the services citizens want three years from now. So the balance scorecard will really be something that will work both internally and extern externally to show progress toward kind of predetermined goals or metrics that show success or improvement. Yes, over a period of time we will, in the future, we will be measuring ourselves against our own standards gotcha. to, to look for improvements, to look for where we could exceed and other areas of concern. Great. Well, this discussion has been very enlightening and most helpful, hopefully, to all of our viewers. At this point, I'd like to just kind of throw it around the horn with a few questions that folks out there might be thinking about if that's okay with you both. Absolutely. Okay, we talked about travel training. We touched on a little bit. Uh, someone out there might say something like, there's got to be more fat to be trimmed in the budget somewhere. Uh, how would you go about responding to that? We've tightened the belt pretty, pretty well over the last four or five years, but there must be something out there that we're just not saying. Well, you know, the city organization spends a half billion dollars a year, not counting the pass through to uh, the schools. And you're never going to uh, run a half a billion dollar uh, enterprise without having some expenditures that are deserving of further scrutiny. But I guess one of the things I wanted folks to, to think about was, uh, you know, we always need to look at those accounts. But in the big picture, you're not going to balance the budget by cutting $50 out of a training account or not letting somebody join their professional association and those kinds of things. Well, we have tightened up on all of those kinds of things. We've cut travel significantly. We've reduced the amount of management and overhead positions significantly. What about things like materials and supplies? You can only cut that so much. Uh, it's my fundamental philosophy that many of you have heard me say that at the end of the day, an organization, an excellent organization, is comprised of three things. Excellent people, the equipment to do their job, and a plan of action. And so if you don't give people the tools to do their job, you're not going to have an excellent organization, for example. I was really glad I was able to remember all three of those things. <laughs> we didn't spend much time talking about these other various funds outside the general fund. But if they've got revenue sources, why not, I'll throw this to you, Lisa, why not consider using some waterworks revenue 
or some stormwater management fee revenue to kind of fill the gaps in the general fund. The other funds that you're referring to, Chad, we often refer to in-house as user fee funds. In other words, there's their targeted services with a specific revenue to support that is charged to the user, to the citizen, to support those services. And because that revenue is specific to the services, you just can't go hacking off and taking, you know, buckets of money to support other functions. Uh, we have covered some of the admin overhead costs through those user fee funds, but for the most part, they are dedicated revenue, not to mention they have their own pressures that they have to face. For instance, in the um, sanitary sewer fund and in the uh, stormwater fund, you've heard many discussions about regional consent order. Those are pressures that will be coming down from the state government in the next couple of years that will potentially drive that rate higher. That's what's called an unfunded mandate. Absolutely. Right. And the city has many of those. Right. So uh, we're talking about pressures from the state. The school budget, we've not spent much time talking about that, but I know the city provides substantial support to schools. What do we see for their budgetary future for fiscal 13 and how does the, fact, how does the, school, how does the city factor into that? Well, I'm certainly proud of the level of support we've been able to provide to Newport News Public Schools. Um, it, you know, as difficult as the city has had it in terms of cuts from the state, I believe it's fair comment that over the last couple of budget cycles, the schools have uh, really taken some big cuts from the state. Uh, we have tried to keep our support at as high a level as we could, given our own challenges. And I believe in the, the current fiscal year, the year that ends this June, our contribution to the schools is uh, at $112 million. It's only a million dollars less than its peak uh, right at the beginning of the recession. So the city has been a more reliable uh, contributor to the schools uh, than the state. Uh, of course, the school system is anxiously awaiting the outcome of the next General Assembly session to see how their biennium will be affected. The, the general wisdom is that there might be some more cuts, but they probably won't be as drastic as the ones in the last couple years. We're going to do everything we can to support the schools, but obviously in a situation where our overall revenue is going down by six or eight million dollars from, from the year we're in, it's going to be difficult to, uh, to, to do very much to help them. What about some outside of the box thinking like consolidating services with some of our neighboring localities? You know, that's something that people raise uh, with some frequency. And, and as you know, uh, I am philosophically completely open to that, and I think our city council is. The practical limitation with that approach is the, the rules of the game, so to speak, the, where the political boundary is uh, affects all kinds of service delivery and procedures and standards. And um, while we continue to look at those things in areas like libraries, emergency communications, uh, fire and emergency medical services, um, and, and some other categories, it's very difficult to uh, come up with something that in the short run can generate savings. There's probably a greater prospect of coming up with shared services that improve citizen experience uh, than there is in actually reducing costs but you're certainly not going to find me uh, advocating against exploring uh, those kinds of possibilities. And I, and I know that uh, the city manager of Hampton uh, is similarly inclined. So we will continue to uh, look for opportunities, but I don't want anyone to be under the impression that there's some panacea of cost savings uh, when it comes to uh, shared services. I keep coming back to you for new revenue or ways to fill the gap. I know there's a, a general fund, fund balance. Why not simply use that to balance the fiscal year 2013 budget? Oh, very complex question, and see if I can do this as simply as possible. She will kill me if I recommend it. <laughs> that? That's one of the reasons. Um, first of all, just again, making it on a household type basis, you would not want to go to your savings on a routine basis, monthly, more than once a month, to cover your regular operating costs. And 
by going to fund balance, that's what we would be doing. Instead, again, we've chosen to cut our expenditures to fit within our paycheck, our revenue stream. Um, we do have um, financial management uh, policies that restrict our use, which are good discipline for the city. But again, for routine, everyday operations, no, you don't want to use your savings. You want to save it for extraordinary or special events. So, for example, if there was some natural disaster, something where the city was completely uh, out of business for a period of time, mm -hmm. you need to have a savings account that you could go to to maintain emergency operations until the economy of the locality got back on its feet. That's the real practical reasons why mm -hmm. uh, you really need to, to hold on to that money. Beyond the, the, uh, the sort of the family analogy, mm -hmm. which is it's just not a good way to do business to dip into your savings all the time. You want to have an operating budget that is sustained from year to year, which is not to say uh, that you can't reach into that from time to time if your uh, accounts build up beyond a certain threshold. But even if you do that, you want to use that money for one-time things, avoid debt, keep your debt service down, keep your family mortgage down. You don't want to use it under any circumstance for ongoing things. Like you would never use your savings for a raise or to meet to, regular payroll expenses. Yeah, or, or, or health care because you would owe it again the following year and where's the money coming from next time. Okay, well not to oversimplify but it sounds like we're in for another challenging budget year and I'm sure our citizens will have some insights and some thoughts. How can they go about contacting us to provide some comments or how can they reach us for additional information? Excellent question, and we always love to hear ideas, suggestions, and comments. You can see by the slide that's being shown right now, several ways to contact us. You can contact us through email, through calling our office directly, from coming to visit, and we'll be happy to talk to you more. On the internet, there are some other informational documents that a citizen might find interesting. Um, one of them is, is the Citizen's Guide to the Budget Process that offers a broader perspective of what goes into the annual operating budget process. And as soon as my budget is ready to be recommended to Council, uh, sometime later in March we will post that on the website mm -hmm. uh, so that everyone uh, at home can uh, review it and, and form their own opinions. Great. So with that, I'd like to offer you both the opportunity to provide any closing comments that you might have for our viewers. Lisa, why don't you go first? Mm. So many thoughts in so little time. Covered a lot of ground today. Yes, yes we did. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will have a small growth, if not a level budget, which for the general fund for the upcoming fiscal year, which is quite an accomplishment considering our revenue streams. Um, I think there will be another opportunity for very hard choices and I would just like the citizens to understand by listening to the comments that we've made today that these aren't taken lightly, that they're seriously researched, considered, and viewed for the long-term sustainability. So it will be a hard process. We do have the citizens in mind, but we also have to live within our means. Well, I guess there's several things I would like to leave folks with. Uh, one is, in this kind of discussion, you know, you're always torn between, you don't want to sound like Chicken Little and the sky is falling, but you also want to make sure folks understand that uh, there are difficult choices and the easy decisions have, have long been made. I think it is important to say that our economy in Newport News is unusually diverse. We've come through this recession better than many, many folks. And there are cities in America that are arguing about whether they can afford to buy a new fire truck. Uh, we, it has not come to that in this community. Um, and we are laying the groundwork for progress uh, in different parts of our city. And in the future, I think you'll see many great things uh, once again happening in Newport News. But uh, going into the fourth year of, of declining revenue situation, there are no easy cuts left to make. We're already asking our employees to do more with less. Uh, we're asking them 
to work hard with not a lot of uh, upside potential for their income. We have to be concerned about the future of the organization and the skills of our employees at a time when a large portion of our workforce is nearing retirement age. Um, and the things that could easily be cut that folks wouldn't notice are gone. Um, this year is probably going to be um, harder uh, than some other years. And um, I hope you're right, Lisa, that by the time we're having this conversation next year, um, some, of those, um, some of those trends will be moving in a different direction. Me too. Well, great. Appreciate you both taking time out of your schedules to visit with us today. And I think this has really been helpful for our citizens tuned in to get a better understanding of what it takes to build a budget and some of the challenges that we faced in the recent past and some of the challenges moving forward. And uh, we will endeavor to produce several more TV shows in the future to keep you abreast of our progress. And uh, appreciate your time and your attention. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks.